By now, you've heard about Global Poker, one of the fastest growing online card rooms available in the US and Canada today. So what's stopping you from trying it out? Global Poker is a safe and secure social poker site that uses their own patented sweepstakes model. Signing up is easy. You can use Google, Facebook, or just an email address. You can always play for free on Global Poker, but you can also buy gold coins for additional play, which will earn sweeps coins that can be redeemed for real cash to a bank account, Skrill account, or even as a gift card. Get a free 5,000 gold coins when you sign up right now at GlobalPoker.com. Poker Stories is an audio series that features casual interviews with some of the game's best players and personalities. Each episode highlights a well-known figure in the poker world and dives deep into their favorite tales both on and off the felt. Hello and welcome to Poker Stories, a podcast brought to you by Card Player, the Poker Authority, and hosted by me, Julio Rodriguez. This is episode number 111 featuring Lee Markholt. Uh, Lee is 57 years old and has been playing poker professionally for the last three decades. He has 4.4 million in live tournament earnings, which includes a half a million dollar score for winning the WPT World Poker Challenge in Reno back in 2008. In fact, for a long while, he was the leading casher on the World Poker Tour, a record which has since been stolen and smashed by Darren Elias. He also won the PPT main event at Bellagio and finished second in the 5K 6 Max at the 2013 WSOP for almost $400,000. But uh, even though he has quite the tournament resume, he has always considered himself to be more of a cash game grinder. It started with limit games in his native Washington state and then shifted to pot limit games in LA and Las Vegas before the poker boom. And then ultimately, he found himself in places like the high limit area of the Commerce Casino or Bobby's Room at Bellagio, playing games as big as 200, 400, no limit. But poker is just one part of Lee's interesting story. Lee's first passion was for bull riding. And like his father, uncle, and brothers before him, it was something he was really good at. Unfortunately, his career was cut short by injuries. Uh, And when I say injuries, I mean injuries. You're going to hear some pretty gnarly stuff when you get to that part of the podcast. Anyway, that's enough intro. Let's get to my conversation with Lee Markholt. I am here with Lee Markholt. Lee, how are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you, Julio? I'm great. Um, you know, I, I just uh, recently spotted you down playing some poker at the Venetian not too long ago, and I know you've been uh, you've been traveling a little bit for for cards. Is that something that you missed over the last year? Yeah, for sure. You know, uh, I en- actually enjoyed the summer. Believe it or not, uh, didn't miss a series that much because summers in the Northwest here are uh, just beautiful, and I was. Uh, out, you know, in the great Northwest, hiking and playing on the water. And uh, so so it was good. But, uh, you know, eventually uh, I was ready to go play again. You know, like, like after a certain amount of time, you kind of get that fire back and you want to compete. So uh, I'm competitive. So, yeah. Well, it's interesting you mentioned the fact that you, you got to do something else for the summer for the first time. It's been almost, what, 25, 30 years since since you missed the series? Yeah, it's been a long time. I I, I want to, I don't know, I want to say maybe 92 or 93 might have been my first series, and I don't think I've missed one since. Um, somewhere in there. I, I, don't, I don't know exactly, but <laughs> it's been a long time. It's interesting you never decided to make the, the move to Las Vegas, given, you know, you spend your summers here and so much of the rest of the year here as well. Yeah, you know, it's uh, for me, it's been uh, more about balance. You know, I'm divorced now, but, you know, when I was raising my family and married and uh, I wanted to to have a home base and come back home and, and not be gone all the time. And I didn't want to didn't really want to move my family to Vegas. And, and I love the Northwest. I'm uh, very close uh, with all my family, siblings and uh well, my mother, mother and father have both both passed now, but um, yeah, I've always been close to family, and and I think it's, I think ultimately it's given me longevity because it gives me uh, 
a balance and an escape from poker is where I think if I lived in Vegas, it just becomes an everyday grind and and uh, you get burned out. And I've seen that a lot, actually. And so I think it's worked well for me. Well, we'll talk about all those frequent flyer miles you racked up. Uh, <laughs> uh, but first, I want to go back, dig into your roots. Uh, you were born and raised in Washington? Correct. And... You basically were grew up on a farm, right? Yeah, well, my mom and dad divorced when I was young, uh, about four, I guess, three or four. And uh, I lived with my mom in the city of Tacoma until uh, I was 12. And then I moved out uh, to, my, to my dad's, um, which was a small farm. Um, it's a Tacoma address, but it's actually Puyallup, 10-acre farm. You know, we had we had cows and chickens, and my my father and uncle they kind of pioneered raising organic beef, and ultimately my dad built a butcher shop, and plus uh, my uh, my uncle and father and both my older brothers rodeoed. Um, my uncle was uh, one of the greatest bull riders to ever come out of the Northwest. He uh, he won third place in the world in 1970. Um, which, yeah, you know, I stumbled upon a photo of him uh, doing my research because you two share a name. Yes. And uh, I was looking for Lee Markle bull riding photos. And I came across one of him, his in the 70s where it was apparently a, a big uh, injury. And he said he was one of the only times he, he really got really injured and had to it, go to the hospital. Yeah, you know, injuries are, are part of it, of course. And, and part of it is luck. Like, you're going to get hurt. It's just a matter of how bad and how often and um he he was pretty fortunate and stayed fairly healthy but he was also probably the toughest man i've ever known in my life so he would ride through injuries i mean i can remember him having a torn bicep on his riding arm and his bicep was down you know at his elbow and he was still riding bulls like he just (laughs) he's just the toughest man i've ever known in my life so he rode through a lot of pain but uh he also didn't get you know he didn't have any uh he had one pretty serious kind of life-threatening injury, but uh, yeah, and part of that is, uh, you know, how well you ride, you're going to be less prone to get injured when you have a choice of when and where you can jump off as opposed to being thrown off a bull. <laughs> right, and some skill has to come into play at some point. <laughs> yeah, that, that being said, world champion bull riders have been killed or, you know, disabled for life, so, you know, it's it's... It's a dangerous sport. So this was, I mean, obviously the family business, I guess the day job was the meat business, right? Uh, Correct. I mean, you had real aspirations to be a bull rider yourself. Yeah, no, my, my early dreams is I wanted to be a world champion bull rider. And I, I pursued that. Uh, I was passionate about it. I I lived and breathed it. Um, When was your first ride? Well, I started riding, so my, like I said earlier, my, my dad, uh, we raised cattle on the farm, so there'd be these, you know, feeder calves and steers that, and my dad and uncle had previously built a rodeo arena when they were in high school. So we had the bucking chutes and, uh, you know, we, uh, me and my brothers, we would put in the feeder steers in the bucking chutes and, and, and try and ride them. So that's where it all started. Uh, I got on my first full-size bull, I believe, when I was 13 years old, which was too young. I probably should have waited. Because, <laughs> uh, and, you know, when you're when you're riding full-size bulls, which, you know, they, they average 1,600 pounds, and you're just a, a skinny, undeveloped, you know, 110-pound kid, it's, uh, it's, it's going to wreak havoc. And uh, I probably... Uh, I still have torn up groin muscles from what, you know, injuries. And I probably should have waited. Uh, but <laughs> it was hard to tell me no back then, you know. I yeah, just, so you, I, you were eager to jump on? Were you scared? Or, or is it just like, you know, the ignorance of youth? <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I mean, I was eager, of course. And there's, you know, there's a nervousness, but, you know, it's an adrenaline sport. So once that adrenaline's flowing, you know, you, you're not thinking about, the dangerous part of it in reality you could lose your life every time you do it but you you don't think that you just block those thoughts out and uh and once you've done it long enough you kind of 
and I, I didn't really realize this till later on why it was so hard for me to walk away was uh, you get addicted to the adrenaline rush and there's no drug that could get you as high as like making a good bull ride, at least for me and, and other bull riders that I've known over the years. It's you get addicted to that adrenaline rush and it's really hard to walk away from, even though you probably should have, you know, years and years ago. It, it's just like, you know, boxers never retiring in their prime, hard, hardly ever. You know, I, I think it's, it's, you know, part of it is, You've always done it and you've done it well, but then it, that, that adrenaline part of it too, it's, that's what makes it really tough. <laughs> it's why uh, Tom Brady keeps signing up for another year. <laughs> hey, since he keeps winning Super Bowls, more power to him, man. <laughs> you can still do it. So, um, so let's talk about the injuries. You mentioned, you know, you tore your, your groin there and, and uh, you know, I, I read that you, had, you broke seven ribs and punctured a lung and all this. Yeah, no, I had uh, I had more than my that was going back to our earlier conversation where you know part of it is luck as far as injuries because you know a bull can step on you or they can step right next to you you know it, it's kind of a game of inches and uh, I unfortunately I had more than my share of injuries um, yeah that time I uh, I was only eighteen years old. Uh, well, I guess my first kind of serious injury, uh, other than tearing up my groin muscles, I, uh, when I was 16, I dislocated my right shoulder really bad. And I remember being, uh, having to go to the emergency room in Port Angeles, Washington with my shoulder dislocated and my, neither my mother or father were available and they couldn't even put my shoulder back in place until they could get a hold of my parents. Because I was because I was underage, <laughs> so <laughs> I think I was in a hospital for hours before they finally got a hold of my dad. At that point, somebody's got to step in and say the law is the law, but we need to help the kid. <laughs> yeah, I, it was like well, they, I think they gave me something for pain, but they they couldn't work on me. So 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 after that first dislocation, um, I kind of. Didn't let it heal good enough and was eager to ride some more. And then I dislocated it again. And then I dislocated it playing basketball. And eventually, I think the last time I dislocated it, I actually just rolled over wrong in my sleep and it came out. Oh. And at that point, I knew that I had to have surgery on it. So I went in. I think I was, uh, yeah, well, I was probably 20 when I had that shoulder surgery. It's called a Bristow repair. It basically limits your range of motion. You lose 10% of your range of motion. And so it makes it impossible to dislocate your shoulder again. Makes it a little hard to throw a football or, you know, some other things. But uh, <laughs> so I <laughs> yeah, had that done. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and when I broke my ribs, I guess that, that was when I was 18. Um is that from a fall or because the bull stepped on you? The bull stepped right in the middle of my back. Oh. Um, and this was pre-vet. You know, now they have vests and helmets. And this was before all of that. They had That wasn't a thing yet. So, yeah, I was in a Tenasket, Washington, and the bull stepped right in the middle of my back. And, uh, you know, immediately I couldn't, like, breathe. I just thought maybe the wind was knocked out of me. But then... I realized it was much worse than that, and uh, they took me to the hospital. Um, yeah, seven broken ribs, a punctured lung. It did something to my vocal cords, too, where I actually couldn't even utter a word for about a week. Um, I had internal bleeding. And, uh, yeah, I think six days in the hospital, and uh, five weeks later, I was crawling on the back of another bull. <laughs> yeah, you still did it for another six years after that, which is crazy. Uh, <laughs> um yeah, so obviously, you know, let's t let's talk about the glory years or the glory rides, I should say. Was there anything that stands out in your memory? Well, you know, I, I won some bull ridings in the Northwest. I never, uh, I never got to compete at the national finals rodeo or anything like that, just because, uh, for one, I just kind of rodeoed seasonally in the Northwest, and I had dreams of going full time. But every time, I would start to make progress and kind of getting to that level. A bull to, com to your compete, arm. I would get hurt again. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, um, I had another really bad injury where a bull stepped on my ankle and, and broke it all the way through. 
had a pin and a plate holding it together is basically just crunched, you know. Um, mm -hmm. That's actually another funny story. I had, this was in the Dalles, Oregon, and uh, Bull stepped on my, on my ankle, and I knew I'd been stepped on, but I didn't know, you know, your adrenaline's rushing, you're like, you got to get out of the way, the bull's still there. I got up to like take a step and it just folded over. It's like, oh. uh, it just folded over like I'm on a stump. I'm like, oh man. So I get back behind the chutes and the medics are there. And I had some brand new boots that I just bought in, like a week before. And the medics, you know, this time I didn't have any money. Like it was hard, you know, like I, this is a pair of boots that I worked hard and paid good money for. And they wanted to cut up, cut the boot off. I wouldn't let them. I said, no, just pull it off. Oh. <laughs> Looking back, that was probably a pretty good, pretty bad idea just because, like, I, pretty much all that's holding it now is ligaments and tendons and skin, right? It's like, no, just be careful. Just, you know, just pull it off. And luckily, they didn't pull my whole foot off. But, uh, yeah, I had surgery the next morning in the dowels. And I remember the surgeon, I remember him telling me, he says, look, he says, I did the best I could, he said, but there's a good chance you're going to have a permanent limp. You're probably never going to be able, be able to run again or do those things. And, you know, but I, me being me, I, I refused that answer. And uh, I worked really, really hard at rehab. And I was playing full court basketball a year later. Yeah. And uh, well, I, don't, I, don't have, I don't have a limp. I don't have, every once in a while, I'll feel a little achy in there, you know, on a rainy day, a little arthritis. But other than that, it's it, it's good. So... I mean, you said your uncle was the toughest man you ever met? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I may have inherited just a little bit of that. But. Yeah, I'd, I'd say so. <laughs> I, I do have some bull riding questions. I mean, the whole point is is to stay on for eight seconds, right? And then after Correct. that, it, there's no bonus time or anything. Like You, you can't ride it for 30 seconds. Nope. And get, nope. Yeah. Yeah. You. You. The the stock contractor will be gets very mad at you if you don't if you don't jump off within a second or two of that eight second whistle. So uh, so you're there's two judges and you're each judge scores you one to twenty five on how well the bull bucked like how hard the bull was to ride degree of difficulty how fast he was a spin you know all that stuff and Which then is out of your control right correct. And then the other, then there's one to 25 on how well you perform, and that's your control, how, how much in control you are. You can get extra points by spurring a bull. That's basically kicking him with, like, one of your legs. Like, um, so you can get extra points that way. That's not really too big a thing because most times you're riding really good bulls. You don't have an opportunity to do that. <laughs> so... It's yeah, so it's one in twenty-five on the bull, one in twenty-five on the rider, and there's two judges. So the best possible score is a hundred, which has only happened once in history. And you know, it's subjective. So I actually know the person, he's a kid about my age that made that hundred point bull ride, and it was it was a really good bull ride, but that's not to say there were there hasn't been, you know, a hundred other rides just as good. Yeah. It's you know, like Which I ninety eights that could have been hundreds. Yeah, and and Scores have have increased even since when I quit. Like it used to be, if you got a, a score in the high seventies, that was a really good score, and I was going to win most rodeos. Uh, but now it's like you, it's like in the eighties, and sometimes in the ninety nineties, and that was just unheard of. So they've they've kind of raised the level, but I mean the bulls are better too, the cowboys are better, but. When my uncle, when my uncle went to the National Finals Rodeo, like he, you, I was looking back at, at the scores and there were scores in the 60s and 70s, which that would be a re-ride today. Like they've just raised the scores because they think it's more exciting for the crowd. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think, I think the highest score I ever, I ever made was uh, 82, which was oh. a really, really high score back then. But, but now it's not a big deal. So <laughs> well, I'm guessing 50 of it was came from you, and uh, the other 32 came from the bull who wasn't who wasn't uh, pulling his weight. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was you know it was a good bull, and I, and I did my best. But yeah, it's and like I say, it's subjective, and it's like anything that's judged. There's like sometimes the judges don't get it right. Sometimes there's favoritism. There's politics involved. You know, you name it. So, 
you it's 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 good to be well liked put it that way so random question but if uh if you had to pick one poker player uh who you thought would last the longest on a bowl who would it be oh wow wow let me give this some thought <laughs> I mean, one one name that comes to mind, but I just his body style is not good for Burrite. Would be Dan Blazarian, but he he doesn't have because I know he's a tough ex Navy SEAL, does crazy stuff. He doesn't like have a lot of fear, uh, but he doesn't have the body type for it. He's he's, he's a little big. top heavy. <laughs> he's a little top heavy. He's big and bulky, which doesn't behoove you. It's it's you know the centrifugal force will not be on your side. Bull riders. I mean, I was big for bull rider. And you know I'm I'm five eleven, and when I quit riding bulls, I weighed one sixty five. Not that I weigh a lot more than that now, but like uh, I was big for a bull rider. The average so bull rider, really strong bull... legs, a strong arm <laughs> to hold down. Yeah, and and the uh, the ideal build is like long legs and a short torso because of the centrifugal force, right? So if you have a long torso and you're taller, there's more whip there's more centrifugal force that you have to deal with so you know that's why there's a lot of short bull riders like five 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 six you know they weigh 125 pounds that's 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 kind of typical for bull riders so i was i was big for a bull rider my actually my two older brothers are bigger than i and they were extremely big for bull riders um my uncle was above average for a bull rider he was he was 510 and you know 160 or whatever, but he was he was fairly big for a bull rider. Now, when I watch it in slow motion, it kind of looks like the the rider's body goes kind of limp on 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 the whips that the bull's making. You know, uh, I don't know if that makes you better in a car accident because you can make your body go limp or something. But <laughs> <laughs> well, but it, it's it's kind of like a dance. It's it's a give and take because you're not going to overpower the bull, and all the bull's power is in his back end when he kicks. So a bull jumps forward with his front feet and then drops and kicks out his back legs. So when he's extended in that kick, fully extended, you have to be really pushing with your arm and you have to have your arch back, your back arched. And but you can't have you can't be back too far because that's where all the power is and it's going to rip you out of there. So when a bull is jumping forward, you're actually reaching forward with the bull. When he extends, you're you're kind of coming back and pushing with your riding arm and arching your back. And it's almost like you have to be in rhythm with them. It's timing. And if you if you get a little bit, you know, too far back, that's the danger zone. Nobody can overcome that. Like they're, they're going to rip you out of there. Or if you get, you know on one side or the other on a really good bull, you're, you're just done. So not only do you have to stay in the middle, you have to stay in time with him. And like I say, you're, you're not going to overpower a bull, although, you know, you have to have strong legs and a strong arm and a strong hand to hang onto the rope. Um, you know, but ultimately it's, it's more timing. The, and, the bull uh, dance. <laughs> the bull dance. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, you're obviously injured a lot. Uh, I'm assuming you pick up cards as a teenager. Yeah, you know, I, I kind of played as a kid just with buddies, but we didn't really know how to play. You know, just farting around, and and, and then uh, my, you know, pretty much every rodeo, all the cowboys that would want to play poker, and none of them really knew how to play very good. And it was more of a party. You're drinking beer. You know, you might be smoking a little pot, whatever. It's, it's more of a party. It's not really, but thinking back on it, I, I do remember a couple of people kind of taking it more seriously that were kind of the consistent winners. I, I wasn't <laughs> just <laughs> because I was, I was young and I was drinking and just having fun. And, um, when I, when I got serious about poker, so my dad played poker and he had, uh, he played in a local taverns around Tacoma where we grew up back then there was no casinos but there was poker rooms there was a handful of poker rooms uh five table maximum was was the law then and it was all player dealt there was no center dealers and they mostly played stud and low ball that was before Texas Hold'em uh 
But my dad took the game seriously. He had, I don't know, at least a half a dozen poker books laying around the house that, you know, he studied the game. And he definitely won more than he lost. Um, but uh, after I had my shoulder surgery, that's when I was 20, um, I couldn't do anything and I couldn't work. And I started reading my dad's poker books. And it I was intrigued, um, to say the least. And a couple of books just really resonated with me. And I started thinking about the game more and, and uh, started playing in the local card rooms. And uh, I probably lost for the first six months. Uh, most of the times I lost for the first six months, but I was paying attention to what the winning players were doing. And I don't know, I think within a year I became one of the winningest players in the local card rooms. And uh, yeah, I think by the time I quit riding bulls at 25, I was, um, I was a pretty good poker player, at least locally. You know, they were small games. And, uh, but I was, I get, I got to the point where I was winning more playing poker, you know, a couple nights a week than I was working in my dad's meat business the whole week. So, so this is the eighties, right? So what does poker look like back then? Uh, well, it's still, like I say, um, the games I first learned playing in the local card rooms around here were, uh, seven card stud, five card stud, five card draw, uh, all games with a with a joker, um, mm -hmm. seven card stud, high low split with a joker. Um, these were these were the main games, and then eventually I think uh, Raz was introduced, and then um, Crazy Pineapple and Tahoe. Some of the flop games I still hadn't played Texas Hold'em or Omaha, and then I think it was about. I guess it would have been about late 80s, mid to late 80s, where um, there was all the talk of Texas Hold'em was getting legalized in California, and, and the games were really good. And, and then I, um, I think the first time I played Texas Hold'em was probably a tournament. Um, then there started to be little local tournaments around, around here, like $100 buy-in, $200 buy-ins. And... Uh, yeah, then I then I started uh, studying Hold'em. Uh, limit Hold'em at first, I think I played a bunch of Limit Hold'em. Uh, I think uh, the first Hold'em book I read was Sklansky's book, uh, Hold'em for Advanced Players, or Limit Hold'em for Advanced Players, I believe it was. Yes, yeah. Um, I think him and, and Mason Malmuth may, maybe co-authored it. Advanced uh, Limit Hold'em. Yeah, yeah, and that and that really uh, that really opened my eyes, and that's when I started making uh, trips to to the Bay Area and to Reno, um, and started playing Limit Texas Hold'em. Um, back then, like ten twenty was a huge game for me. And then uh, I think the first time I played Big Bet live cash game poker was at Artichoke Joe's in the Bay Area. But it was pot limit. Back then, there wasn't any no limit games, cash games being spread. Not during the World Series, not during any tournaments, not anywhere. It was everything was pot limit, and uh, that was the first time I played big bet cash game so, poker. This is pre boom, so you have the series, you have uh, the Super Bowl of poker, um, but really not a whole lot else. Um, are you traveling a lot to, to California and Vegas at this point, or are you just sticking with Washington's? Uh, I know they have a lot of smaller rooms in Washington. Yeah, I was still mostly just grinding at home, playing like 10, 20, and 20, 40. And uh, that was when uh, some, I think it might have been the late 80s when some of the casinos, the Indian, the tribal casinos started to open up in Washington and they and they spread like 2040 limit hold them um I also played a lot of uh, limit Omaha eight or better there was a local card room that played uh 10 20 limit Omaha eight or better every day so I was you know mostly doing that and I would take a handful of trips a year during the big events during the series or the hall of fame of poker and this was all you know downtown at the horseshoe I think maybe the four queens ran the big tournament once a year. So I would go to the big events and maybe play a tournament or two, but mostly just play cash games. 
and play some satellites. The only way that I would jump in a big tournament is if I won a satellite. I think the first three or four years I played the main, main event of the World Series, I had won a satellite seat to get in because, I mean, I didn't I didn't have the bankroll to, to put up 10K. Um, so, yeah. Or, just, or the crazy uh, the crazy gamble. <laughs> some people, all they need is 8K, and they still find a way to get into the main event. <laughs> yeah, I, and I was like, nobody knew who who I was at that point. I hadn't I was I hadn't done anything. I mean I was I was making my livelihood at poker, but you know, none of the tournament players knew who I was. Like I remember I still recall the first time I played with Danny Nogranu, and this was before he was known. This was at like a small tournament at the Orleans, or maybe it might even have been the Gold Coast. It was either the Orleans or the Gold Coast when they ran a tournament series. And, you know, in these tournaments are $100, $200 buy-ins. Maybe maybe $500 was a big one, you know. Um, and I remember sitting at a table with this kid who, like, he constantly chewed on a styrofoam cup. And you can, you can ask Daniel about this. He'll, he'll confirm it. He had this tick of he, like, chewed on, a like, a styrofoam coffee cup, literally till it was almost chewed to pieces. And, and, and I... I Nobody knew who Daniel was at that point. He hadn't won anything yet. I think this is when he first started to come out to Vegas. But uh, obviously, eventually, uh, Daniel went on to great things. And uh, actually, the first World Series of Poker final table that I made, Daniel was there, and it was his first bracelet. It was the pot limit hold'em, the back of the horseshoe. Oh, yeah. Uh, I believe it was 98, 97 or 98. And that was Daniel's first bracelet. Well, I was at that final table. He, matter of fact, he busted me. <laughs> so, um, but Daniel, Daniel and I have been we've been pretty good friends since then. Um, well, I gotta I gotta ask you know the uh, money maker wins WPT rolls in with their whole card cameras, and you've just been sitting there you know for over a decade playing this game, and all of a sudden it's blowing up. Are you like you know you, you know? licking your chops or what's what's going on here are yeah you, no, are you I, surprised I, I really was i timing couldn't have been better because i had already honed my skills pretty good i i think i was you know one of the better players and now all of a sudden there's this perfect storm there's a money maker effect there's a world poker tour with a lipstick camera everybody wants to be on tv um and there's online poker it was like the perfect storm for poker so there's this huge boom that you know and uh all of a sudden, like, not only tournaments were great, cash games were beyond belief. Um, and I still didn't have a significant enough bankroll to just start playing all these WPT main events. I um, Eric Seidel and John Juanda backed me for a year or two, um, putting me in the WPTs. And... I think when the smoke cleared, we broke about even. I might might have made them a tiny bit of money. Um, but my big breakthrough was in actually where I actually got a big enough bankroll to start kind of uh, playing bigger cash games and bankrolling myself in bigger buying tournaments was uh, I won uh, the uh, professional poker tour at Bellagio in 2005. Uh, right, which, the PPT. The PPT, which that's a, that's a story in itself. So when the PPT started, you know, there was this list you had to qualify for. You had to have certain criteria. Yeah, what if and, poker wasn't open to everybody? <laughs> yeah. No, so I wasn't on the initial list for the professional poker tour. And I, I saw the list when it came out, and I, and I saw, like, a lot of people who hadn't had as much tournament wins as me, not as much money, not as much success. And I'm like, wait a minute, why? Well, how come I'm not on this list? So I, I had to do a little bit of a, a politicking of my own, and I reached out to to a couple people. Um, one being, I think, Mark Gregorich, the other one, Linda Johnson, who both knew me well, and, and they thought, yeah, you should be on that list. So I missed uh, I missed the first couple events because I wasn't on the list. And then the first event, when I did get on the list, the first event that I played was the Bellagio, which I won. So <laughs> that was very gratifying for me to, like, first I'm excluded, and then I get on the list, and I win the first event I play. So that was 
Right, because yeah. there's also no dead money in that tournament. It was all pros, or at least no dead money at the time. I'm sure. If we yeah, back I mean, there was there were some celebrities, <laughs> but it was mostly tough pros. And and the Bellagio, I think the Bellagio event was the biggest field they had. You know, and like I say, it was it's 95 percent a very solid field. And uh, so that was that was huge for me, not only confidence wise, but I had 100 percent of myself. So it gave me a nice boost to my bankroll to where I started. Um, playing bigger cash games, which were just unbelievably good at the time. And I just kind of never looked back. It, uh, it snowballed. And I was, I'm fortunate because I was, I was in the right place at the right time. I basically, my whole career of poker, which, you know, spans 30 years, I had made more money between basically 2004 and 2010 than I have all the rest of the years combined. Like that was those, those six, seven years were like where I, I put myself in a position to where like I could retire if I chose to, but I still enjoy the game. So it's, I'm fortunate. I'm fortunate that it was, it was good timing for me. And, and I also, I had a lot of um, already fiscal sense, you know, financial responsibility that I, I knew how to, invest well and take care of my money and, and knew that, you know, it wouldn't always be that way. So as I was making the money, I was doing good things with it, which, you know, I, I have seen so many players over the years that have won a lot more than me that are, that are broke just because they haven't been fiscally responsible. Um, I mean, you know, the story, but anyways, of course, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah so, let's talk about some of the highlights during that, during that run, because, uh, you obviously had a few, uh, WPT final tables and then I was actually there in 2008 in Reno when you won the World Poker Challenge uh for about half a million dollars. Yeah, yeah. That was that was huge and, and a lot of fun and and, and just ah, I felt like I got a monkey off my back cuz I knew I was capable of winning one and and I'd cashed in so many. I mean, I had for years and years and years Julio, I had the the record for the most caches in main events on the World Poker Tour. Uh, just up until a couple of years ago, I held that record because I was I was consistently yeah. making the money and running deep, and 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 I made it some final tables, and I was it was just kind of like a monkey off my back when I finally won one. So yeah, I remember you had a few times where you bubbled like the TV final table, I think, and then yes, I did the Foxwoods, a big one where I bubbled that one, a seventh place bubble. Um, but then I then I I but actually I think I bubbled Foxwoods twice, but then I did final table at once. Um, I ended up getting six. I was knocked out within the first five minutes. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, and then uh, I final tabled Jacksonville. Um, I can't I think remember. Borgata as well. Yeah, Borgata one. Yeah. Um, so let's talk. Let's talk about the series because for for a while you were listed as the the best player to never win a bracelet. Uh, you did have a really close call in two thousand thirteen. You won almost four hundred grand in the five k six max no limit. Um, I, is, is that something that still bothers you? The, yeah, you know? you know it does. It does. It's it's one one caveat, one one thing that I haven't done yet that I that I don't, I don't know. I guess I don't. Part of me feels like that would be the icing on the cake for my poker career. Like it wouldn't be complete until I win a bracelet, but. As you know, it's it's not easy to win bracelets, and especially those huge fields. And um, I'm getting older. Not that I I still feel like I can compete. I um, I mean, I just final table to 5K in Florida a couple months ago and ran deep in the main event. I I know that I can still compete with these with the younger generation. That being said, um, I know that I don't have the mental stamina that I used to have. Like. A 12, 13-hour tournament day is really taxing for me. Um, mm. By the end, by like the last level, I'm 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 drinking coffee at 1 a.m. just to get through the last level. <laughs> you know, just because one mental error and, and obviously you're done. So it's I did, and I used to be able to play you know 16, 20-hour sessions when I was younger. But that's one thing I've noticed about as I get older, I don't have the mental stamina that I used to have which is going to be problematic moving forward in tournaments. <laughs> right, so, especially at the series where it's a minimum of three days, 12 hours each day. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, yes, yeah. yes. 
it's a lot different than cash where you could put in a sharp eight hours <laughs> and then just get up. Yep, exactly. Yeah. And let's talk to oh sorry, go ahead. No, I was I was just gonna add that, you know, I've always considered myself a cash game player. Um, but funny yeah. now now that I've uh, now that I've gotten to this point in my life, um I kind of get more of a thrill out of running deep in tournaments because it's not really about the money anymore. Like, and I'm not playing like super nosebleed stakes anymore. I'm playing upper levels, mid to upper levels of no limit Hold'em or pot limit Omaha, but I'm not, I'm not playing 200, 400, no limit or any, any of these really nosebleed games anymore. Just because to be honest with you, I don't, I don't want the swings. I don't want the variance. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm in a good place in life and I don't want the stress. I don't want the stress of, you know, dropping a hundred K in a cash game. So, um, well, yeah, yeah that I mean, makes sense. As, as you get older, <laughs> your investments should become more conservative. Yeah. Yeah. You're less, less risk adverse. Um, so, so I'm content just playing, you know, whatever, 10, 20, no limit and, you know, win or lose five or 10,000. That's great. I'm, I'm, I'm content with that, but I'm, Kind of like tournaments are, I don't know, tournaments are really annoying and tough and obviously like boring for the, until you get deep. But once you get deep in a tournament and you're making finals tables, they're, they're lots of fun. And that's kind of what, kind of what does it for me now. So, you know, I'm still going to play some tournaments and dabble in cash games a little bit in between, you know, when I have time, but that's about it for me. I'm, I'm enjoying life more now and doing other things. So we talk about your close calls, you know, at the series and and elsewhere. It's kind of like you know the bull riding analogy, where you get your eight seconds in, you hit the ground, and you just hope the bull doesn't step on you. You know, it's, it seems like at some of these final tables, you've gotten stepped on a few times. Uh, yeah, you know, I I've had some. It's I've had some some tough ones. Like when I was heads up there, the most. Yeah, which probably, one probably the one with Eric Lindgren, the 5K heads up. Just because I felt I outplayed him, um, I felt, and you know that was streamed live online, and a lot of my friends watched it online, and they're like, "Wow, like he just got hit with the deck. You like played every hand like pretty much perfect." And I felt that I was playing perfect. I felt that, you know, when we got heads up, he had about a four or five to one chip lead on me, and I got to within even just playing my ass off. And then, but ultimately, you know, he got pocket aces five times in our heads up match. This is just from the time we got heads up. So, and I, and I laid down top full to him once when he had quads. Like, I mean, I was playing perfect poker and, but ultimately like, as you know, heads up and the blinds are huge. Like if somebody's going to run that good, you, you can't overcome that. And, and I'm not taking away from Eric. Eric's a great player. But that was a tough one, just because I thought I played, I played so well. I I thought that I deserved to win that one, but I didn't. So that one, that one stung the most, I think. Yeah, and I think he that was his first one as well, right? So well, yeah, it was a second. So there was some, some um, storyline or something that he was. Yeah. Playing. Anyway, um, yeah. let's talk cash because you mentioned that you know you've always considered yourself more of a cash game grinder. Um, you know, there were stories of you playing high stakes at commerce with like Kenny Tran in, in these giant games and, and, and the like, uh, what stands out in your memory? Um, because you're playing 200, 400, right? No limit. Yeah. I think the biggest game I ever played was in, was in Bobby's room at the Bellagio. Um, it was 200, 400, no limit with, um, a thousand dollar Annie. I think it was on the button. Maybe. Um, and it was a crazy game. Rick Solomon was in the game. He'd been on a two day bender. Uh, the minimum buy-in was a hundred K and I was on the list from the day before I, I didn't get into the game until the next day. And by the way, the game, other than Rick Solomon, who was drunk and stoned out of his mind, it was pretty much all pros. Interesting. But, um, but these guys have been playing all night. I said, okay, I got in the game the next day when I was fresh. I thought, okay, this is a good spot. I took a shot and it was still at the time. That's a huge game for me. Um, and yeah, six figure buy-in. <laughs> and I got, I got the Boris seat. Of course, uh, I had Rick Solomon right on my left and he's straddling 
every hand anywhere from you know a thousand to five thousand sometimes the game was crazy and um i bought in a hundred i lost a small pot so i added on another 50k well then i ran it up to about 200 and i want to say 260 270 something like that just because rick solomon uh bluffed bluffed off to me when i had quads <laughs> so, <laughs> So he doubled me up. Um, was that the biggest pot you ever won or lost? Um, I'm about to get to the biggest pot I ever lost. <laughs> That's just one, one of my questions. In the, in the unfortunately, history. I'm about to get to the biggest pot I ever lost in my life. So the game goes on. I'm up. I'm up. Uh, you know, about 100k or 110k, and uh, I have a pretty good, decent amount of chips in front of me now. And Pot comes up, and Rick Solomon's on my left. I think I must have been I must have been small blind, and he was big blind. Viffer Viffer was in the game. You remember Viffer? David Pete, yeah. David Pete. He opens for a raise. I think somebody else called. I looked down. I have two aces. Or no, wait a minute. Am I on the button? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm in the small blind. Anyways, I look down. I have two aces. I three bet. Solomon four bets me. Viffer calls. At this point, the bet is like 18,000. Viffer calls 18,000. Get, gets back to me. And I make it, I think, 60,000. Because I'm out of position, you know. I'm I'm happy. Like I don't. I want to get it heads up for sure. Yeah. And Sol I'm, I'm hoping Solomon just rips it in, right? Anyways, Solomon calls Viffer folds, so we're heads up to the flop. And by the way, Solomon could have anything at this point. I mean, I watched him. I watched him bluff it off pre-flop with a 10-4. Like he put in 100k on a bluff with a 10-4 suited. Like he's just. There's no telling what Rick has this 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 hand. I I think I'm giving him credit for at least you know good suited connectors or you know something. I'm giving him credit for for something at this point. So flop comes the worst flop ever is Jack ten nine. It's like the worst flop that you can imagine having yeah. pocket aces in a <laughs> five bet pot, right? Even if he's got queens, he's the even if he's got queens or ace queen, he's got more outs than I wanted to have. But now there's, you know, there's already, what, 150K in the pot? Um, maybe a little more. I think there's about 150K in the pot. And, and I've got, I don't know what I have left. Or not much more than pot size bet left, really. Solomon's got me covered. I decide... I'm just, I know he's going to bet if I check. And I'm, I, my only play is check raise them all in to get full value and, you know, get my money. And I, I feel if he doesn't have anything, if he completely missed, if I just make a big bet, he's going to fold. So I thought, oh, I'm just going to, I'm just going to check. Sure enough, he bets, but his bet sizing scared me. Like he bet like half pot, like 60K. I'm, I'm like, God. But I mean, yeah. what do I do? I, I'm not folding yeah. aces to him. I can't fold <laughs> aces to him because he could have the ace queen. He could have, Two queens, you know, you could like whatever. He could literally have deuce four off. <laughs> I put I, it I in. Told, there's Houston Curtis told the story in this podcast of Rick Solomon doing <laughs> crazy stuff with like perfect, perfect draws. I mean, it, he yeah. could literally have any two cards. Well, his bet sizing told me he had something. Yeah, at least a, at least scary. a draw, yeah. at least a draw. But I'm, I'm I can't fold. Anyways, I, I rip it in. He calls. He flopped a set of jacks, and brutal. I lose this pot. His pot was five hundred and. 65,000, I think, 570,000. And yeah, and I rebuy, I think I. Wow. <laughs> I, re I rebuy, you know, so now I'm stuck 150 in the game. I, I, I rebuy 100, and the game breaks two hours later. I got back a little bit of my money. I think I ended up losing 110K in the game, which I had made like playing 10, 20, and 25, 50. I've been at Bellagio for like 
10 days and I've been crushing the 10, 20 and 25, 50, no limits. I was up like 100K, 100K plus in these, in the smaller no limits. And so I took a shot. So, you know, yes, it was, it was a huge loss and, you know, by far the biggest pot I'd ever lost. You know, I, I mean, if I win that pot, I'm, <laughs> you know, it's, I'm winning almost a million in the game. It's, it's ridiculous. So it's hands like that that really, really stick with you. By the way, Kenny Tran was stuck over a million in that game and he got winners. And Solomon, even after winning that big pot for me, he still lost over a million in the game. Crazy. And, and he checked himself into rehab right after the game. Like he, after he's been on a three day bender and he went straight to rehab. <laughs> Man. Man. So, so, so what does that do to you? I mean, obviously the trips a wash all, you know, two weeks of work gone in a, in a day. Uh, do, do you bounce back from that? Just go to the next stop and pick it up or. Does it yeah. Luckily time? back then games were, you know, there were so many good games and I, you know, nowadays I definitely wouldn't play that big just because for one, poke the cash games, cash games and tournaments, they're not nearly as lucrative as it used to be. There's not as much dead money. The bigger cash games that are good are all private now, which I don't get to play in. You know, that's that's damaged these the casino cash games so much. Yeah. Is these 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 people running private or semi private cash games, sometimes right in the casino. And but you can't get in the games unless until they're about to break up or unless like they are desperate for a player. That's the only way you're going to get in. Um, so I, I, so I've kind of, I'm kind of over that. I'm kind of like, well, you know what? If I, if I can only get in these really good games two or three times a year, well, that's going to make or break your whole year. Like one bad session, you can't recover from that. You're going to have a losing year in poker from, from jumping in. Yeah, it's a good game, but so what, you know, um, doesn't mean you're going to win. So I've, I've learned to really pick my spots and, and I've also had really good game selection, you know, for the most part that, that time, that game was maybe, maybe not good. That might, that might've been a bad decision on my part, just because number one, it's, it's a lot bigger than I had been playing. And number two, it's, you know, it's a very volatile game, you know, like obviously the hand I lost, you know, that stuff can happen. So that was probably not a great decision to play in that game. So, these days I'm uh, <laughs> I'm content just picking my spots and but it's hard like back then and in, in the peak of poker cash games if you had more than two pros at your table you had a bad game right it was like literally like there might be two pros and the rest just recreational or you know businessmen and actors and athletes and like the games were so good but now it's like if you have two non-pros in your game you have a great game now so it's changed did uh were you drawn to the game at all because of the adrenaline rush you know you, you mentioned that you used to get that from bull riding i'm wondering if you ever got that from poker at all or what you replaced that with yeah and you know making final tables of big tournaments is a rush it's not the same it's um it's definitely not the same I guess because there, there's not that life threat <laughs> factor involved, but it's the definitely a rush. Not jump on your chest with. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's it's the closest thing to it that I've experienced it as far as just having that rush. But in poker, you have to you have to learn to like get in a calm state too. Like the first couple times I made big final tables, you know, I, I may have been overly excited and, and, and made bad decisions because you have to be you have to be in the moment and make the best decisions and, and being overly excited and, and stuff like that is is detrimental, right? So you have to kind of get in that zone. Um so yeah, but it's it's definitely a rush. What about uh other adrenaline sports? Have you have you dipped your toes into anything else since bull riding? Yeah, I uh, well, I went skydiving um, once, and I didn't do it again. Not because it really scared me; it just wasn't really what I thought it would be. I guess one thing I did was that kind of did give me an adrenaline rush was uh, whitewater kayaking. 
Okay. You know, down, down Whitewater in kayaks. And, uh, you know, I, I dated a gal uh, for a while, ex-girlfriend who was into that, and she got me into it. And and uh, that was fun. Yeah. We got some rapid-fire questions to wrap up here if you're ready. Okay. Let's see. Um, best swap or piece you've ever had of anybody? Oh, that one's not close. Ben Lamb, the year he uh, won third in the main event. Oh, wow. And, and by the way, at least according to Ben, I was the only person he swapped with that year in the main event. I, like, I was quite just, a year. <laughs> yeah, he, like he was on fire. And, you know, and Ben and I had played, and we were, we were friends. And, and, and I just like, you know what? I think I want to ask Ben if he wants to swap. Because I only swap with two or three people. And uh, I just think because he'd already won the Omaha event, and he's just on fire. And so I asked Ben. He said, yeah. He said, yeah, I'll swap with you, Lee. Two percent. So, so that was like that was like an 80k swap. Prior to that, I was buried in swaps, but I think because of that, I'm still ahead in swaps. <laughs> nice. <laughs> that was a great swap. Yeah. So you, you mentioned that he was on fire. Do you believe in momentum in poker? I do. I do. And I think it might be more of a confidence thing than anything, right? You, you know, you know, you're playing good. You're, you know, you just. You're going to push the envelope more when you're like running good and confident than if say you've been, you know, coming off a bad streak and losing and, and you, you, you get hesitant. You're not going to pull the trigger on a bluff when you should, or call a bluff when you should, because you become hesitant. Well, when you're confident and running good, then you're, you're playing, you know, you're going to do that more. You're going to you're going to push the envelope more. So yeah, I do believe in that. Uh, we have a question here. What was your worst job before poker? <laughs> I'm guessing you only had the two, right? Yeah, I mean, what was the worst? There's, there's different the aspects of, of work. So working in my in my dad's butcher shop. So there was not only the cutting the meat part. That wasn't bad. I didn't mind that. But at one point, we also started butchering poultry. We we built our own poultry plant and slaughtered chickens and ducks. And so that is the worst job by far that I've ever done. You're pulling guts out of chickens. It smells like chicken shit. It's just the worst. So that is the worst job I've ever done. That might be the worst job anybody's ever said on the show. <laughs> 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 but you know i did i did it you know you do what you got to do so yeah pays the bills <laughs> yep. uh what was uh, uh your largest non-poker wager largest non-poker wager all right this probably would have been a dumb prop bet i made in turks and caicos uh was right. there for the wpt i was and... there that was the most degen weekend of all time. <laughs> so this is a bet with with Matt uh, Giovanni. Gia what's how do you say his name? Matt Giannetti. Giannetti. Matt Giannetti. Well, it started with with uh, Dan Blitz was gonna go on the ocean over for twenty four hours. Like that's how the bet started. Like, and then but then like. That got called off because there was supposed to be a storm coming. Whatever reason, that bet didn't happen. And then Giannetti's saying, well, I can, you know, I can stay in the pool for 24 hours. And I remember I, going out in the middle of the night and seeing him there. Was kind yeah. Of <laughs> and David Williams made the bet. And I liked David's side. And so I, so I took a piece of that bet. Uh, I can't remember how much... David bet, but I think I think I might have bet like 20k of it. So, and thinking back on it, it was like there should have been some other stipulations. Like, so he had a Matt had a buddy stay with him the whole time and brought him like warm water to pour on his head and his body. He brought him food and drink. Like if there would have been other stipulations, I think I don't think Matt could have did that bet because you know yes it was a pool and yes we're in the tropics in the Caribbean but it still got chilly at night and you're in the water 24 hours and yeah, I think also he was neck deep. <laughs> yeah and also 
I didn't know this, but he was bust at the time. He really needed the money. And he also told me afterwards, he said, I was sick for two weeks. So I, he said, I got like pneumonia. He said, I was sick for two weeks after that. <laughs> so, so all that being said, I don't know that it was a horrible bet, but I think I, obviously I lost, but I think maybe if there would have been some stipulations, I, I might have had the best of it. But as it turns out, I didn't. So that was it. Yeah, that's definitely the dumbest bet I've ever made. That was such a weird tournament because I think it's still the only WPT ever held there. But they, uh, it was supposed to be two starting days. They didn't have enough players. They canceled the day. And then everyone was just on the island in this all-inclusive resort with nothing to do but make problems. <laughs> oh, by the way, there was a good cash game there. That's right. They had the one <laughs> cash game in the, in the, in the back. I think, we played, I think we played 50, 100, no limit. Yeah. Yeah. That was, yeah, I, I remember almost, playing uh, it and, and doing okay in it. And uh, it but, Randy Campbell's people. Yes, as a matter of fact, they they were scrambling because they wasn't there some kind of guarantee, and they had to like scramble right. and put a bunch of the local people in. So what I remember was they hired the Bellagio tournament crew to run it because I remember Jack McClellan was there with his crew, and uh, they had a million dollar guarantee to the winner. But then they didn't have enough. They didn't have enough players to even get a million in the prize pool, so that they. So basically, Jack came to the tournament and said, "Do you guys want me to make it all winner take all?" <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, "No, pay the final six. And I think uh, Ryan Campbell ended up winning his own tournament. The one he did. helped organize. There was there was still. Uh, I'm sure it didn't happen, but there was speculation that. There, there was something to happen for for him to win that, like some cheating going on. But, it wasn't, it wasn't cheating. I know exactly what happened. I've actually, I had dinner with Ryan e, uh, before that, and um, so he's was a big shot on Turks and Caicos Island and knew a lot of the people there. So when they were having trouble meeting the guarantee, he went around and <clears throat> got twenty of his friends and bought them all into the tournament so that they could make the guarantee, essentially staking them. And then some of those people may have played a little bit. Uh, Got some chips to them. <laughs> maybe, you know, I don't want to yeah. accuse anybody of anything, but maybe they were a little nicer to him than they should have been. Yeah. Well, that was that's an old <laughs> trick, you know. Like you, you stake all these people, and and uh, and then if you if you end up with them deep in a tournament, they got to dump their chips to you. That was the accusation back in the day. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I witnessed it, so I'm pretty sure now. There you go. Um, Let's see. What is a talent you don't have that you wish you did? Oh, that, that one's easy. Music. I would love to learn a musical instrument, and I've tried to learn to play guitar. I'm looking at a keyboard in my house right now that I've tried to learn to play. I want to learn to play piano, and I took lessons. And I, I don't know. It's just been, it's been a struggle for me. I, I guess I'm not musically inclined. Although I, mean, I love music. I listen to it all day long, but. Yeah, that that's that's one for sure. I hear you. I'm actually recording this in my my band room. I'm staring at a keyboard, electronic drums, my oh, daughter's nice. bass guitar. <laughs> I can't. I play wish it, I wish it I came. Can't play any of it. <laughs> yeah, I wish it came easier for me. I really do. Yeah, I'm super jealous of those people who can just sit down and just crank something out. Uh, by by the way, Julio, if uh, if it's going to create some kind of uh, lawsuit for me, you better delete that. What I just said about. <laughs> let's see if he's even a listener maybe we'll, we'll blur out, or bleep out his name and see if anybody can guess who you're talking about <laughs> um let's see uh who is your celebrity doppelganger or have people told you growing up that you look like somebody oh yeah well well right now is daniel craig i i like people have been telling me for the last few years that i look like daniel craig you know the 007, James Bond. James Bond. That's kind of cool. Um, but I've, it's actually been a couple prior to that. Um, actually, the first televised poker that I played, um, uh, what was that tour even called? It was it was um, Louis Louis Asmo started it. Do you remember this tour? It was. It only happened one year. Um, What'd you finish? And, I finished second to um, another se another big second for me. Um, the WPPA. Yes, yes. I don't know what that stands for. So 
It was at the Orleans? Yes. World Professional Poker Association or something like Louis was trying to create some players association. But anyways, there was, uh, yeah, this was, um, what was the network that covered it? Um, I can't remember that either. This has been a while ago. What what year was that? Was that like 2000, 2001? That was 2004. 2004. Okay. Yeah. Um, anyways, so I finished second in that. But I remember the camera crew the whole time. But the, it was a great structure, and the final table lasted forever. And the camera crew, they kept saying, and this is when I used to shave my hair off. I have a little more hair on my head now. But uh, the camera crew said, oh, you look like Bruce Willis. So that, that was another one. I think my when my hair was bald and, and our nose is kind of similar, I think it's more of the profile. Yeah, Bruce Willis yeah, is another you, one. You used to keep a tight shave. A tight, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Make, no, I, right? I kept it as close as you can get it with the Clippers, basically. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, what are you interested in that most people aren't? Um, most poker players or most, most people, people in general. Do you have any like general? weird, weird hobby? I guess bull riding is a pretty <laughs> standard <laughs> answer. <laughs> well, my new, my new hobby, and I guess this was also an adrenaline sport. That's it's kind of just an up and coming thing that not too many people even know about is uh, e foiling. So an e-foil is basically it's an electric foil, and you know what a foil is. A foil is the boards that you can ride above the water, like you can ride them behind a boat. You can um, they, you can do it with a, a a kite, you know. So kite foiling they call it. But yeah. what I have is uh, it has a big battery and remote control, and it's wireless. And you, so you don't need um, a boat. You don't need a boat. And you can take it in any body of water. You can take it in salt water, lake water. As long as you have waist-high waist water, you can ride your board. And it's the funnest thing ever. It's, it's the most freeing thing ever. It's like you're on a magic carpet. And you can ride on the water like you're surfing or, you know, you come up into the foiling position and you're like three feet above the water. And it's, it's a blast. And this, so that's, that's my latest hobby. That sounds cool. That's like a motorized and, surfboard. Yeah, that's exactly what it is, and, and there's not too many. There's only, last I heard, there's only like 25 people in the whole Seattle area that own one. So uh, it's a pretty, and they're, they're, they just started making them a couple of years ago. They, make, they only make them in Australia, although there's other companies getting involved now. Super. I was, cool. told, I was told that one of the people in Seattle that own one is Eddie Vedder, by the way, <laughs> which is kind of cool. <laughs> that puts you in a small club. Yeah, yeah. You and Pearl Jam out there on the on the water. Uh, do you like telling people you're a professional poker player? I do now. You know, back in the day before the big boom and before televised poker, people would ask me what I did, and I would I would tell them I was a professional poker player, and I got just the weirdest reactions like, oh, really? How do you do that? Do you cheat? Like, how, how is that possible? Like <laughs> poker had this, poker had this stigma. Like, how do you, how can you be a professional poker player? Like, but now that it's been, you know, televised and all these tours and like, so now it's like, oh, really cool. Have you ever been on TV? That's the response you get now. So, yeah. So now I kind of, kind of proudly say it as to where before I got to where I, I wouldn't like, I'm just, you know, I'm an investor. Like I, I, I quit telling people I was a professional poker player just because of the responses I would get, you know? So, yeah. I wonder if the reaction was better than bull riding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. People are, people are pretty shocked by that one. Mm. Over the years, have you had, did you ever have a nemesis or somebody you couldn't beat, somebody who held over you? Yeah, there was there was um, Horalibos. You remember Horalibos, Volgaris, NBA he, Stat King, who by the by the way is one of the toughest players I've ever played with. Like he he used to play in the same cash games as me, and I never fared very well against him. He and I to this day I think he was one of the best no limit cash game players in the world. Like. Um, he was definitely, I mean, obviously there's, there's a lots and lots of them now. Like every time I sit in a, in a cash game now, even at the, 
even at the 10, 20 level, there's, there's usually two or three really good players at the table. You know, um, the game has progressed and, you know, it's, I, uh, I know a lot of people, my generation who didn't, who didn't progress with the game, who can no longer win at poker. Um, so I'm, so one of the things I'm most proud of is that I can still compete at a high level, you know, um, and I've, and I've had to progress my game. So I'm proud of that. Do you have a favorite gambling movie? Favorite gambling movie, <clears throat> I guess rounders, you know, I, I, I still enjoy that, even though like so much of it, I, you know, obviously us knowing pokers, there's, there's pieces of it that are obviously unrealistic, but I still think it was a good, a good movie. Did you feel the same way watching eight seconds? Yes. Especially <laughs> the first time I watched eight seconds. I'm like, ah, uh, yeah, no. Um, but I, I enjoy eight seconds too. And I actually knew, um, uh, Lane Frost. He was about my age. Um, the, the bull rider that the film was made about. Um, so yeah, there, that's, you know, obviously you can be a world champion and still get killed riding bulls. So <laughs> there you go. Uh, let's see here. Do you use any movie quotes or TV show quotes on a regular basis? Um, once in a while, uh, I'll say like, I got a peach of a hand. I believe that's a, a, a Deadwood, or not Deadwood. Um, what's the movie with uh, Wild Bill? Uh, Tombstone. Tombstone. Uh, Tombstone. I think that's a Tombstone quip. Uh, I got a peach of a hand. Um, I, I do two like guns. To... One for each of you. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I do like to say, and this is not a movie, a movie quote, but a but a song quote. Um, Stuck in the middle with you, the, the part that goes clowns to the left of me, jokers to the right. Yeah. <laughs> I like to <laughs> sing that sometimes at the poker table. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, let's see. Biggest pet peeve at the table. Uh, stalling. Too, the game has gotten so slow. And people, and you know, it went through a period where it was worse than it is now. <clears throat> and I feel like it's mostly the European players that are tanking the most. But I know so many recreational players and businessmen that don't play anymore because the game got too slow. You know, they, they want to, they're there for the social part of it. And that's another thing, like so many of the new breed of poker, they don't realize poker is meant to be a social game. And they're sitting there with earbuds in, on their phones, not engaging and taking forever to play. It's killing the game, Julio. And I've been on my soapbox plenty of times. And for the most part, you know, most of the kids are, they respond to me and they say, yeah, you're right. I'll, I'll do better. Like, you know, and I feel like it's gotten better in the last few years. I mean, but you know, obviously the time clocks have helped, you know, late in tournaments, but even cash games, like nobody will call a clock on somebody in cash game until they've given them five minutes. You know, you're paying time. Like very rarely does any decision need more than a minute. I mean, it's, it's not good for the game. <laughs> it's like, and, and, and what I basically tell, you know, some of these newer newer generation of poker players who are, I mean, I say, look, the people that you want to play with don't want to play now because the game is so slow. You're not social with them. You don't engage with them. You don't talk to them. You're sitting here being non-social, playing like a robot and taking forever. Do you really think, you know, that's good for the game? Do you, you're gonna, Pretty soon, it's, you're just going to be surrounded with a bunch of yourselves, a bunch of clones. That's what the game's going to be. And nobody's going to make any money. So <laughs> I get on my soapbox as much as I can, just for the betterment of the game. No, you're right. It seems like there was a shift uh, 10 years ago where people started to take the game more seriously, treat it like a business, even if they weren't necessarily pros. And that somehow translated into all serious all the time 
you know, robot like, don't give anything away. When yeah. you know, a good part of the skill is getting them to come back for more. Yeah, and engaging, engaging with them, and yeah, poker is meant to be social, and that's one thing right now during the pandemic is with a face mask and plexiglass, you can't really speak to anybody anymore, except maybe the person right next door to you. And even then it's hard. So it's, it's, that's, it's tough to play in that environment, but for now it's what it is. But in general, yeah, it's poker is supposed to be a social game and they're, they're playing for the social part of it. And if it's, if that piece isn't there for them, they're not going to play. So it's, it's a big part of being a professional is knowing these things, right? And a lot of people that used to play big bet poker, no limit, a lot of them are playing mixed games now just because that the limit games in general, the decisions are fast, right? There's no tanks. It's like, you know, you're always betting, you're always, you know, you're always in motion as to where these big bet games is where the big long decisions come. And so I've also noticed that, that, that some of the people that used to play big bet are playing mixed games and limit now just because the game moves faster. Yeah. Well, we end the podcast the same way every time with a question from the random question generator. Here we go. All right. What is the best or worst practical joke that you've played on someone or that was played on you? Oh, boy. I'm to give this some thought. If nothing comes to mind, I could always rerun the generator. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I'm, other than just little stupid things, I can't. Well, you have nice friends. Let's see here. Uh, I, I can tell you. I can tell you. One that my, <laughs> so my brother was a practice joker, and he's done some dandies. I can tell you one of his, or you can just give me another question. Well, if it's worth it. Otherwise, I'll rerun it. So your choice. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> so back in, in the chicken butchering days, back on the farm, <laughs> My brother, he's the biggest class clown, practical joker. So he took a chicken intestines. Actually, I got a better one for you. He's, <laughs> he's, he's done so many. So my sister was going to college at the time at Evergreen College, which I don't know if you're aware of Evergreen College in Washington State. It's a, it's a real, like, you know, liberal tree hugger like that type of school. And my sister happened to be at the butcher shop that day helping because she would help sometimes to help pay her way through college. And we we're butchering poultry that day. And my brother, by the end of the day, he took a duck head because we did some ducks. He took a duck head and put it on her antenna, kind of like, you know, <laughs> one of the old antenna balls. And like on her car? <laughs> on her car. And she didn't notice it. She drove to school the next day with this duck head, this mallard head, on her antenna. Oh, and <laughs> you could, she, she noticed it when she got out of her car at the parking lot of the school. And, like, she was horrified. Because, like, can you imagine? <laughs> like, here's this... You know, liberal, super what liberal, kind of and she's and she's got an animal head on her antenna. So that was, yeah, that's my brother Joe. He was he was good at that stuff. People just looking at her like, what kind of protest is that? I don't, <laughs> yeah, I don't what, understand. What, 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 like she was just horrified. That's great. Uh, thank you so much, Lee, for uh, for coming on and sharing the stories. That was great. Yeah, thanks for having me on. That's it. That is the show. Thank you once again to Lee for coming on the podcast and sharing the stories and uh, also for reliving his painful injuries with us, both the ones on and off the felt. Uh, don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Card Player Media and at uh, Poker underscore Stories. If you want more poker stories in your life, then go ahead and click the subscribe button on whatever device you are listening to this on. Once you've done that, scroll down to the bottom and make sure you've given us five stars. Uh, unless, of course, you are using some sort of weird podcast app 
that has a 10 star rating system, uh, then you should give us 10 stars. If you want to go the extra mile and leave a review, which really helps us, uh, then we want to reward you with a free digital subscription to Card Player Magazine. Just let us know about your review with an email to pokerstories at cardplayer.com to redeem your subscription. Uh, thanks for listening.